we did our security assessments in these environments, we never opted for a thing. We never asked for a diagram. We never asked for all these documents. Didn't say go to this web page, fill this out, and we'll automate something. We did a lot of our stuff very open source. We did a lot of fact-finding what we could find that was public information online. And we would go and meet the client. We would talk with them, and we would um, make them a trusted ally and explain, hey, well, what's your day-to-day life like? Hey. I'm Dino Busalaki, the Chief Technology Officer and OT Guy at Delta Technology. Hi, I'm Jim, the COO and IT Guy. And I'm Craig Duckworth, President and CEO. You're listening to the Industrial Cybersecurity Insider Show. In each episode, we bring you the inside scoop on the world of industrial cybersecurity. We talk about everything you don't know. That you should know. So plug in and power up. The show's about to get started. Hi, this is Dino Busalaki. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Velta Technology. Today we have Ed Turkley, who is the Cybersecurity Software Director for Schneider Electric. Ed, welcome to our show today. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be so, here. So um, can you share a little bit about your, your role and your journey into cybersecurity around industrial control systems? Oh, wow. So it began a long time ago, about 20 years ago, I guess. I was raised in the D.C. area. Um, I learned, I got my cybersecurity training with the Navier Systems Command. But back then, we didn't call it cybersecurity. We called it information insurance. So I was lucky. I rode the wave. And I did numerous cybersecurity assessments, uh, which gave me a lot of tremendous growth to my career to understand the likelihood and the consequence needed to really justify making cybersecurity investments in OT. I also have a lot of experience with GE working there. I wanted to do a bike race from Canada to Mexico, and they told me, well, that's fine. You can take a month off work, but the business needs to be able to quote, scope, and sell cybersecurity. As long as you can do that, we'll let you take a month off work. So uh, my background, I out of that portfolio, the cybersecurity portfolio, we call it Security ST and Nexus OT Armor at the time, training sales engineers, training sales team how to talk about cybersecurity for teams that don't even know what it was and how to build customer trust. And yeah, so that's my background. I would say that on my IT side, I did lead a security operations center. I was a director at DHS for Security Operations Center. And why I bring that up is because I had a four-hour window to contain incidents per SOA. So that's pretty steep. And, you know, we had nation-state cybersecurity attacks. So I owe a lot of my experience being in that high-pressure environment and making our incident response plans tailored to be able to meet that four-hour recovery time objective, whether it was a denial of service, a classified media spill, or a beaconing attack, the list goes on. We had an incident response strategy for that. So. That's that's what I've done, and what I do today is I work with Schneider Electric. I am the director for cybersecurity offer management. I support all lines of businesses and bring in the right cybersecurity offers to market. So I do the business case. Why we wish to either partner, buy, make, or build internally a cybersecurity solution with our offers. And we want to make sure that they're either novel, disruptive, innovative, but really targeted to our customer needs. And uh, so that's that's what I do today. I offer a lot of proof of value uh, and uh, a lot of internal information before it even gets commercialized, before we even start selling anything in cyber. Yeah. So that's where I'm at today. Yeah. So, uh, distinct clients, right? You mentioned clients, as, as I like to call them, as the asset owners. You know, I, I, I come from Rockwell, right? I have Rockwell background. Spent a lot of time working with Siemens back in the day. Not so much with Honeywell or, or Schneider or GE mm-hmm. per se, but... What I what I have found interesting, and I'd like to get your perspective on it, is when I talk about automation technology software companies like Schneider Electric, for example, mm-hmm. and IT's role when it comes to cybersecurity in the control system space. Mm-hmm. A lot of the work that we do at Velta Technology is, is we like to call ourselves practitioners. We're field personnel that, that go and, and do our work inside these manufacturing facilities right out there in the machine area. How are you guys, from a Schneider Electric perspective, what's that relationship look like with IT? Generally speaking, when you're talking about this big boil the ocean kind of term, cybersecurity, <laughs> yet the focus is on OT around control systems. How, how does that blend with them in your experience? I'd be interested in, in, in your perspective on that. 
Well, I'll start by saying that I believe personally that uh, IT and OT are converging. There's no denying that the IT is in the OT. That said, however, the roles and responsibilities are completely different. The one has a focus on environmental health and safety in the environment they're in, whereas mm-hmm. the other side is looking for scalability and really more holistic view of cybersecurity. The thing that's really interesting is that today, it doesn't matter, the, the, the chief information security officer, if there is one, there is an IT, it's going to be held accountable in many ways. So they, they, they cannot ignore OT cybersecurity. So there is convergence that is occurring here. Um, I think it's important to have both involved. A lot of the time in Schneider Electrical, we do is we educate the IT side of defense more so than the OT side because the OT side only knows operation equipment. They understand how it works. In many cases, they may already know how we're securing. But the IT folks are the ones that generally have need a little bit more education on how we're doing that and, and why. You know, what's the focus here? Why why the legacy protocols? Uh, you know, why, whatever it may be. And and I think that it's an education gap that we always do. It's important that we get the endorsement of the CISO and his staff or her staff, because obviously, you know, this, go, this can be a multi-site related kind of opportunity. So yeah. both are equally important. Yeah, Un- unquestionably, I agree that the, the CISO has a very important role. In my experience though, in manufacturers that that have several plants, few dozen plants, it's very hard for a CISO, I think, to be, you know, from a from a global perspective to really understand the tribal activity that's going on inside that plant. And I'll give you some examples. A lot of times we will be told as we're embarking upon what we call our visibility studies and assessment, if you will, putting some of these OT IDS platforms into play so clients can start the discovery process and get that asset inventory, which leads to vulnerability management understanding as, as, you, as you step through this journey. Invariably, we are told a lot of mistruths about the environment because they don't inherently know what's connected in that in that environment, right? Machine centers, they would say, well, that's not connected. Or, you know, that when there's no Windows 7 out there or Windows XP out there or all of these things yeah. that we invariably always uncover and find. Oh, and so, I, so there's this gap, right? Yeah. And, and we want to, well, and so some IT executives in, in my experience will sit there and go, you know what? I don't want to, unless I know the better. It's not my problem. Mm-hmm. Versus somebody who's going to say, I got to get in there and try to figure this out, right? And I get more of, of what I said first than I do of the latter. I, I don't know what your experience is, but... Yeah, I think it's really amazing because, like, my experience is, you know, doing the cybersecurity assessments I've done in OT, mostly around oil and gas, underground storage facilities, oil and gas, um, um, and those environments and mining, um, um, you know... Is wicked places, they really right? Wicked places. Yeah, they really don't know... Um, they don't understand cybersecurity fundamentally. You know, if it's stuck, broken, don't fix it mentality. And of course, patching doesn't ever occur here, and for good reasons. And they really don't understand the risk and exposure. And gaining consensus with them on that, I think, is key. When we did our security assessments in these environments, we never asked them for a thing. We never asked them for a diagram. We never asked for all these documents. Didn't say, go to this web page, fill this out, and we'll automate something. We did a lot of our stuff very open source. We did a lot of uh, fact-finding what we could find that was public information online. And we would go and meet the client, and we would talk with them, and we would um, make them a trusted ally and explain, hey, well, what's your day-to-day life like? right? And we just sort of go through the, their whole day-to-day life. We would eventually do a lockdown in the environment, and we, we would record everything that we saw. And what we did is we would use a way to really identify a consequence and impact. And... By identifying that, really understanding the value of the assets, the business that they have, uh, and, and what it is they're producing, both a mixture of business impact assessment and risk assessment, we're able to get them to prove and eventually understand where their high risk and exposures are and what they need to do. It's a journey, and it, 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 it takes a long time. Yeah. Risk, you bring up risk, which is a really good one. From a risk perspective, have you engagements where the client is being driven by maybe cybersecurity insurance challenges that they've, that they've dealt with, you know, whether they can't get it, premiums are skyrocketing, coverage is going down. Are you, Absolutely. Are you... you know, and I was going to get to this later, there's only 
four cybersecurity controls out there. One of them is insurance. I'll get to the other three later, but the, the insurance thing is um, important to have. Uh, there's, there's definitely part of the, the toolkit, but um, what I'm finding is that more and more companies are needing to find a way to take charge and help themselves, especially if they, if their insurance company uh, finds them viable for any related, not having the right maturity to protect themselves. So, you know, I think that what, what, what you're seeing there is that cybersecurity insurance is what's needed. It's not going to be um, the solution to really make sure that you're going to stay in business. That's for sure. Yeah. And we saw that with a few companies already. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit to Schneider Electric. So t- tell us mm-hmm. what, what Schneider is doing, you know, specifically in this space to help move this needle technology wise, service wise, industry, you know, specific things. I'd be really interested in, you know, obviously we bump into Rockwell out there. I don't really bump into Schneider too much. I'm sure that you guys have a services organization out there that's it's doing similar activities that we're doing. So t- yeah. tell us a little bit about that. So we do a number of things. Uh, the most important thing is ensuring that we're uh, providing that customer trust with our offers, whether they're products to our third-party suppliers or partners or to uh, customers direct. We do projects, integrated projects, and we, of course, we have services too, including sure. cyber su- cybersecurity services. We have a, a global team of cybersecurity business consultants. They provide um, consulting on cybersecurity fundamentally. Um, and we offer cybersecurity solutions in a holistic way. We do, we we have our preferred for whatever reasons, but we you know we we comply with uh, multiple regulations across the globe. We generally follow we, well. We do follow the IE six two four four three framework, mm-hmm. which is much more broader than something like NIST, and it addresses multiple stakeholders. And so that's been very good to take that framework and then convey it to the multiple global or other compliance frameworks. We have a managed security service offer as well, where we manage our customer cybersecurity from uh, remotely. So we have various degrees of offers uh, related with our, our security. Sometimes it's just product security focus. It's just SDL, it's SBOM, it's uh, those related things. So the topic can very cha- very much change depending on who what you're selling. A lot of our energy management side of our business is digital buildings. And there are a lot of buildings up there, let me tell you, a lot more than power generation sites. And this is not a regulated area. And, you know, this is an area that has a lot of opportunity for the cybersecurity industry to help, to grow. There's a number of things out there, but this is a big part of where Schneider Electric plays, whether it's an airport, a mall, a skyscraper, those type of facilities are increasingly becoming more digital. Yeah. So, so obviously you guys have a professional services organization along with the technologies to do this work. Can you elaborate a little bit about your partner or your channel? I'm sure you guys have one, right? Where you have channel partners that are out there who can also do this work also, right? And how, how is that working? Because, you know, I, I look at it as part of the supply chain, which is relevant and important on, from an asset owner perspective from the client, because... They move with the people that they that they see every day, right? Which is usually their their partners in in this particular space. Which is where I get into the whole ITOT rub. Different conversation we kind of touched on a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> but the channel is is key in my view on helping drive this narrative. You know, get into the solution selling versus just widget selling game. So how how is Schneider handling the the partners in this space or? You know, I, I've witnessed what Rockwell has done in the past, and I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on that too much, but basically they would just take charge of it and just run with it and kind of leave the partners in the dust sometimes, right? You might let them hold the paper on the job, but other than that, Rockwell's running it because of the complexities of it, of, of the nature of, you know, cybersecurity. What are you seeing in your channel? Well, so for, like for our partners, we have our certification programs to train our partners to be able to execute on these uh, projects. Along with that, we provide our preferred and desired cybersecurity weapons architectures for specific segments. And in those architectures, we would have our preferred and recommended cybersecurity authoring, which the channel would therefore be trained to be able to use or partner. So that's one way in which we work with our channels and partners. We are OEM agnostic, though, when it comes to cybersecurity solutions, mostly because we're a global company and we, you know, we're, we're not going to always be in a position to be able to say that one product's better than another in front of the customer for a system level cybersecurity feature like a firewall. 
or something like that. But we do right. have our preferences, and we explain why. But my role is to make sure that we are sort of harmonizing our cybersecurity offer to the market so that it's not um, multiple messages going to the market. We're obviously a huge company. And, and you know, we want to provide the best of breed solutions that will work at scale. We don't want to do a, a whole bunch of unicorns unless those unicorns are very specific and targeted to that segment and by VOC by the customer. And that's, that's what I seek. So I'm very much focused on our key accounts and how they see cybersecurity working for them and, and, and make sure we're hearing from them because that's what our offer should be going to market. Yeah. So you would say that you guys are more client facing most of the time, right? Per se, in your engagements? Yeah. It depends on the line of business that they offer, you know, but yes, we could be building a whole city or a section of a city. And and so it'd be very client focused in that regard. And we're doing the project and the execution ourselves. Or if it's a little small thing, or so, we call it a level one product, maybe it's a, a, a switch or a circuit breaker. And it's just going direct to a third party that is part of our partner ecosystem for them to install. So it really varies whether we have L1, L2, and L3 offers. L2 being more integrated systems, the process automation you mentioned, and then L3 being with cloud and services. Okay. Yeah. So as you're engaging with the clients, what are you what are you asking them to focus on? Or where are they? Here, here's an interesting stat, and you may agree with it, maybe not, but I've I've heard this from firms of your size and scope, you know, that that are in this industry, is that 60% of OT environments are still in the unaware phase to aware, right? They're aware that there's OT, they know what it is, they know that there's security related to it, or they're they're not even paying attention. Okay. You got 30% that have actually started doing something. Maybe a POV, maybe they've actually, you know, started bringing vendors in and talking to them. And then you have 10% that are actually down the road running and building out their OT cybersecurity practice. Do, do you see that, per se? Would you agree with those numbers? Do you think that those numbers are changing? And what do you think we, on the industry side, should be doing better to get these clients to focus on their OT cybersecurity strategy? Yeah, I think it's interesting the way you slice that, like kind of more broadly, you say OT cybersecurity, but I think there's different segments of maturity where we look at it from an IEC 6443 perspective, security level one, two, three, four. And that's the maturity spectrum. And we place all of our segments in those maturity spectrum, right? So you have your DOD defense related of the far right top corner of highest maturity with along with oil and gas being very mature as well. And a few customers like that. And you get down in the middle, a little bit lower, you got the semiconductors, the cloud and service providers, the manufacturing. It starts going this way. And then finally, in the far left, you get your building space. So a lot of these digital buildings, right? hotels, so they're, they're, they're franchises, right? They're not, it, it can vary. So the maturity level can vary depending on who you So we start with that. We start with, okay, where, who are we talking to, okay? And then we would go into, okay, what's the challenge, right? If we're dealing with that mature customer, you know, we know they're already on the journey of detecting. We believe that that market is well penetrated, that asset inventory, the Dragos's, Clarities, the Zomis of the world. And they're actually at the cost of moving to being more preventative. All right? they, they're looking for a way to get out of this visibility. They got the visibility, but now they have to do something with it. So they're moving more into the preventive category. And that's an area that I, I personally like very much because we're talking about decreasing the dwell time right? or making mm-hmm. it zero. Well, and in this environment, you know, OT, cybersecurity, this is critical environments. You know, if we have a ransomware, it doesn't give you a chance. Hey, hold on, I'm going to execute a little bit. It, it happens. So detecting to me is a very weak control, it's, but it is a needed control to get the customer on that journey, as you said, right? For those customers that are brand new to cybersecurity, they don't have that visibility. It's definitely important for them to get to that point, to understand their their flow. Why, why, why is traffic talking like this? You know, if, if you can't, the, the motto is obviously, you've heard this before, if you can't see it, then you don't know what the risk is, right? But the preventative side is where I'm mostly focusing on. How do we increase that dual time zero? We do have nation state threat actors that are impacting some of our most important customers, including mm-hmm. Schneider Electric. So I, I would I would say that that's where I spend more of my time on making sure that we're providing a, a more preventative solution. And and the reason I say that also is that from our perspective as a global company, you know, we have 
all these terms being thrown at us. So zero trust, loosening, secure by default, secure by SDL, you know, S bonds. So as an investor, we have to be a lot further ahead than sometimes our customers. Yeah. Well, you mentioned visibility. What is an acceptable level of visibility, right? When you think about it, when you think about all the way down, let's say the drives, right? Level one to zero. Yeah. That's maybe sitting on Ethernet, right? When does that come into play? You're going to try to get the PLCs. You don't want those in the HMI. But how low do you want to go? (laughs) And how low can you go? And you're right. Uh, And you see a lot of the visibility players, um, and we work with several of them, no secret there. You know, they they recognize that they need to be more preventative. They're starting to find ways to hook into other products to be able to alert them. They see something suspicious, you know, see something, say something, do something. But you're right. How low can they go? So a lot of them, you know, are, are, are starting to be able to, it's, it's really the partnerships with the OEMs where they make a difference, right? In my opinion, a lot of it is working with us to really improve that visibility and making sure that they're actually getting what they need so that you have the right asset information or the module or the version firmware, that sort of thing. Yeah. So a lot of that is going on behind the scenes for the visibility plans. Well, and, that, and to me, that's really important. That's getting back to the supply chain, OEMs. I believe need to get better at at least putting the capability into the machine centers that they're supplying to their, their clients. But if you want that level of visibility, you can have it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because we're putting in the necessary components and configurations in order for you to tap into that if you so choose. And I do see that coming down the pipe at some point because, you know, right now, because I'll hear your engineers go, eh, I don't need to see level two. You yeah. know, in the Purdue model, I'm not interested yeah. in that per se, but everything else, you know, PLC is level three. Yep, I'm in. I want to be part of that, but I don't care yeah. about the products. I, I like to think that um, the whole idea of cybersecurity is to decouple your risk, right? And not have such a interdependency on something where you can't run business. So I like to look at it like this. What's the function and what are the process supported from a business mm-hmm. impact assessment kind of point of view? And then you look at the assets that are most critical. If they weren't there, um, how, how would you survive as a business, right? And what's the likelihood of their exposure? It doesn't matter whether it's level one, two, or three. Well, that comes later. And, and with that, though, I will say this. There is a push for a lot of micro-segmentation in this environment at level one and level two. And I believe that is appropriate for a lot of asset owners to do today. We were doing a lot of this, at some of this, and now we're doing this at Schneider Electric. We have a a new thing that we're bringing to market that I'm very excited about and one of our partners that helps us in that environment. The thing that's so important in this space is that any cybersecurity solution that down at level one, level two, is now essentially part of the process. It cannot impact the environmental health and the safety of the process. So because of that, it's really important to have that OEM validate and prove that it works with that SCADA system. And that helps give customers confidence down in that environment that they can do these things. So I think that's really important. So yeah, does it help a little bit? Yeah, Mm -hmm. it does. Because because what I've learned over the last decade, specifically working with some of these OT IDS tools, cybersecurity for for the OT environment, and and you've touched on it, and we can probably dig into it a little bit more if you'd like, Mm -hmm. and you've mentioned it around safety, but it's process integrity. Right. Mm-hmm. And some Absolutely. of the things you get from these tools is, yeah, you're getting this asset inventory, you're getting the inv- vul- vulnerability management. I can look for malware signatures in the environment, but I'm also finding things that might help you run your manufacturing systems better, your production mm-hmm. environment better, you know, mm-hmm. because of disruption that's being pushed down here by IT scanning the network or somebody making PLC changes because you guys don't have good change control, mm-hmm. you know, and, and now you're capturing all this. So you got this process integrity component to it. So do you guys kind of lean into that also, you know, I mean, you've t- been an yep. OEM. That's our bread and blood, uh, process integrity. That's what we right. do. Bread and butter, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely what we do. That's first and foremost. And I think while IT is converging into OT, you're absolutely correct. You know, there, there's that piece there with it's important to have fine trust but verify. Yeah, including with IT. <laughs> yeah, yes. I use that. I use that a lot. Trust but yeah. verify. Even with my young son, still teaching him <laughs> that, what that means. <laughs> So if there's one takeaway that you would, you know, you'd like for our listeners to to learn from Ed Turkley, what would that be? <laughs> I guess the main takeaway on that here is that, you know, you have these corrective controls that you have in place in OT, backup systems, redundant wiring, things like that. You've got these 
detective controls that are very safe to implement, very popular, giving that visibility. But that whole preventative side is, is where we need to be, you know, and, and that's that's the direction the industry is going. It, it, it is about um, secure by default, secure by design. These are the popular buzzwords, zero trust, as much as I don't like that word. It's a, yeah. so that this is the way the industry is moving. And so, again, I, I think it's important to start looking at that and start thinking about that and working with vendors like Schneider Electric and, your, and whoever you're, you're, you're working with to understand how they're meeting that, addressing that. As an example, we, we are looking at doing some completely novel. We have a, a new a thing in the market called SCADA Informed Prevention. It has been presented. It will be released in Q3, but it has been presented on many of the main stages. We're actually taking the SCADA, which has the knowledge of the physical world, all about number one, temperature, vibration, frequency, heat, Harmonics. sensing. That's the SCADA. It's not in IT. Yeah. <laughs> it's what yeah. it's what Strider Electric's been doing. It's what the GEs and Emerson's been doing. The knowledge is there. How do we get it out into the IT and provision the IT so that the physical world is what we want it to be without having a cyber physical event? Yep. And that's what we're doing now, bringing the market, is we're taking that intrusion prevention and flipping it on its head. It has no policy. SCADA has the policy. But how do we take SCADA and tell the intrusion prevention system what exactly is going to happen at an exact point in time? It could be a very dangerous command of a mob list. It's a right yeah. and a no, I get it. And a hacker could spoof, like a man in the middle, um, pretty much every uh, OT environment if they're in. That means every firewall out there or IP, ID, IPS would be useless in that scenario. This is what the in controller framework um, proved to us. That was, so we great. have an offer to address that. So I wanted to share that. No, that was great. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I was actually just at a client uh, last week who's going getting ready to kick off a project mm -hmm. because they want to do a better job of predictive maintenance. And so they're putting in everything you just said. They're going to put sensors out there for harmonics and bar vibration and thermal, you know, things to help them determine when's a better uh, time to take that machine down or based on things I'm seeing, I need to get this thing down before the motor blows up. And, and I made that connection because we're also running an OTIDS um, project in that facility. And it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I'm collecting data, sensor data out of your environment to your point. It's on the digital side versus mm -hmm. the physical side. Mm -hmm. But there is a connection for that. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I was thinking about that last week when the engineer was telling me about his project that he was kicking off. And you walked right down the path into it. And I'm thinking that this is how you tie OTIDS into that, because it's the same thing. It is the same thing. It's almost like we're doing the same thing and we're both hitting it from different directions. We're trying to protect <laughs> it from the outside in. But SCADA knows all. I mean, it knows the physical world. So how do we leverage that knowledge to make informed, secure right. decisions? Yeah, great. Thanks for tuning in to the Industrial Cybersecurity Insider Podcast. To stay up to date with our latest episodes, be sure to click the follow or subscribe button now. And if you found this podcast helpful or have a topic you'd like us to cover, please leave us a review or let us know. If you're interested in learning more about Velta technology and how you can get safer sooner, visit veltatech.com. That's B-E-L-T-A tech.com. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.